Hello and welcome. Tonight, more outrage over the killing of farmers in Bornu State. President Buhari sends federal government delegation to the state vowing to bring an end to insurgency in the Northeast. House Committee grills Minister of Interior on the inability of the Agro Rangers to stop the killing of farmers in Bornu community. EFC Syria reigns former secretary to the government of the Federation, Babashir Lowal, and six others over alleged 544 million Naira fraud. And American drug maker Moderna set to apply to the country's Food and Drug Administration for the emergency authorization of its coronavirus vaccine. Plus business, sports, and later international news from our London studio. On business news tonight, Central Bank of Nigeria grants Nigerians unrestricted access to foreign exchange as latest amendments in diaspora remittances. On sports news tonight, France's Stephanie Frappard will become the first woman in UEFA Champions League history to referee a men's Champions League match on Wednesday. It's been outrage and condemnation following the gruesome murder of 43 rice farmers in Bonu State, an incident that has raised questions over what options are left for the authorities to end the insurgency in Nigeria's northeast. But assurances are coming from the president, who has vowed commitment to making more resources available to the military to prosecute the war. He conveyed this message through a federal government delegation that visited the troubled state today. In all of this, Governor Baba Gunazulum is recommending what he believes are ways to deal with the challenge. But the House of Representatives is also tackling the Minister of Interior on the inability of the Agro Rangers to protect the 43 farmers during the attack. Meanwhile, strong assurances are coming from the President on his commitment to fighting insurgency and all forms of insecurity in Bornu State and all over Nigeria. President Mohamed Ibuari conveyed this message through a federal government delegation to Borno State, led by the President of the Senate, Senator Ahmed Lawan, to commiserate with the people of the state. The government, he says, will make more resources available to the military to prosecute the war against the insurgents. Meanwhile, the state governor, Baba Ganazulum, has asked the federal government to consider strategic alliances to assist in claiming remnants of the insurgents in part of the state. 43 farmers working in rice fields in Koshobe, a Borono village, rounded up and killed by insurgents. Their only crime was making an effort to avoid starvation. A federal government delegation is in Meiduguri on a sympathy visit on the directive of President Mohamed Buhari. The Senate President leads the delegation, which consists of the Chief of Staff to the President, among others. Your Excellency, Mr. President, wants to assure you and the people of Borno State of his continuous commitment to fighting insurgency in Nigeria, particularly in Borno State. He asks us to assure you that no efforts will be spared. Government will do everything and anything until it wins the fight against insurgency in Borno State particularly. Wish to express my sincere appreciation. For Governor Babagana Zulum, it has been a cycle of heinous crimes against humanity, and the end appears not in sight. He wants the government to seek help to end the war. One of our recommendations is to ensure immediate recruitment of our youths into the military and federal military to supplement the effort of the Nigerian military. Our second recommendation is to ensure the engagement of the services of our neighbors, especially the government of Chad, the government of Cameroon, and the government of Niger, in clearing the remnants of the insurgents in the shows of the lecture and in Mandarahim. Our third recommendation is for him to engage the services of mercenaries to clear the service against the 
The federal government delegation thereafter visits the palace of the Sheikh of Borno as well as Zabamari to commiserate with the community. This is a goodwill uh, message to the government and people of uh, Borno State. We were able to go to the village where the atrocities occurred and were very well received by the people because they wanted to hear from the leaders to commiserate with the families and the community and uh, that is why we are here. Faced with hunger and insecurity, the people are in despair and each new day alive is considered a miracle. As they bravely pick the pieces of their lives working, they seem well aware that tomorrow may never come unless the government does more to secure their lives and property. And there may be some light at the end of the tunnel in the fight against insurgency, insurgency and banditry in Nigeria, especially as it relates to the reinforcement of the firepower of the Nigerian military. The military is assuring that the deal to get a dozen Super Tucano aircraft as part of the agreement sealed by President Buhari during his visit to the United States when he met with President Donald Trump is still on course. The 12 fighter jets sold to Nigeria by the U.S. is to aid combat action and air assaults after extensive discussions with the U.S. government. President Mohamed Buhari in April 2018 placed an order for the aircraft. Channels Television gathered that some of the fighter jets will soon be delivered to Nigerian military and that that may happen in a matter of weeks. The fighter jets are expected to be delivered in two batches with everything expected to arrive before the end of the year 2021. Over 30 experts from Nigeria are said to be currently undergoing trainings in the operations and repairs of the Super Tucano aircraft in the United States at the moment. Apart from the 12 Super Tucano from the United States, the military is hopeful as well of also taking possession of one, three J-17 fighters from Pakistan. Meanwhile, more reactions are pouring in following the gruesome killing of the 43 farmers in Bornu State. This time, the Minister of Interior, Mr. Aruf Alekbeshola, is giving reasons why the agro-rangers could not intervene in the killing. He said the outfit has been stretched to its limit. Our correspondent Terry Ikumi reports. It's the final day for the various committees of the National Assembly to conclude the budget's defense process. The Minister of Interior, having failed to honor a previous invitation, meets with the House Committee on Interior. Internal security takes precedence as a lawmaker questions the efficiency of the security agencies under the ministry specifically the agro-rangers. Following the gruesome killing of 43 farmers in Borno State on the 29th of November. I understand you have this, uh, is it agro-rangers agro in civil defense who escort farmers to the farm? How can you now account for the farmers that were gruesomely murdered just last week? when these rangers should be taking them to the farm, particularly in hot spots such as Borno. Without the agro-rangers, there would not have been any food production at all in the northeastern part of Nigeria. None at all. And with the strength of that unit, there is a, there is a limit to which they can perform and, uh, and uh, defend those they are supposed to defend. We have stretched them to the maximum. The minister also believes that the security agencies are doing the best that they can. We should simply invest more in intelligence gathering. With intelligence, effective intelligence, much more could be done to prevent the tragedies that we are experiencing uh, here and there. And that is the best I can say here. Our units, our agencies are doing the best they can. As the committee looks into the ministry's budget and the appeals from the minister for more funds directed at internal security, they ask that budget proposals to the budget office be made available to the National Assembly committees. It is pertinent you also make that communication to the relevant committee or committees in the National Assembly. Because at the end of the day, we will not understand the full uh, import of 
what you require if we don't know it because we only see your envelope. The lawmakers believe this would enable the committee to understand the differentials between the budget envelope and proposals made by the various MDAs. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, in the last three months, Boko Haram insurgents have carried out attacks in the northeastern state of Bornu, but this latest attack seems to be the most violent in recent times. Here's how it's occurred. On September the 30th, about eight soldiers were killed and others wounded when terrorists attacked their logistics convoy near Mate in Boronu State. On October the 25th, troops killed 22 Boko Haram militants in Damboa. On November the 4th, Boko Haram insurgents attacked a military convoy with landmines explosives killing nine soldiers en route Malam Fatori where food items were to be distributed. Also on November the 8th, Boko Haram terrorists attacked Goza in a midnight raid, but no casualty was reported. On November 21st, three soldiers and two members of civilian joint task force were killed in an ambush by Boko Haram insurgents at Gajida Mungunu. And it seems in spite of the several victory calls by the federal government, the war against terror is far from over. In this report, our correspondent, Aurel Lua Shonibare, looks at the security challenges of Boko Haram in the northeast. What began as a small rebellion in Bornu State in 2009 has turned out to become a monster, terrorizing and killing. Was there any sign that should have been noticed? Major General John Enenche is attached to the defense headquarters. He says long before the emergence of Boko Haram, cracks were noticed. And, uh, incidentally, I want to state that uh, I was part of it as far back as 20 years ago. The criminals who call themselves Quanta Quanta, robbing people, collecting levies and all, we uh, captured some weapons from them. These are the same kind of weapons we are seeing today. As time went on, its reach spread to other states in the Northeast region. The number of those rendered homeless or killed is in the thousands. Government rose to the challenge of fighting the insurgents and recorded many victories, which led the federal government to confidently declare that the insurgency was quashed. However, since the publication of this in 2016, there have been more attacks by Boko Haram and more killing. Each time this happens, the government responds with counter-attacks of its own until it appears the enemy has retreated, then declarations of victory are made. All areas where the uh, terrorists I have been eating. Uh, they have identified them and they constantly raid those areas. So that's the spirit, and I'm sure the progress is quite uh, commendable. The latest killing of farmers in Bonu State indicates that the war is far from over, as a terrorist group who have now broken into cells of bandits, kidnappers, and rustlers run away to wreak havoc another day. What will it take to attain peace in the northeast region of Nigeria? The federal government. The governor of Bono State, Babagana Zulum, has a suggestion of beefing up the military with numbers. The recruitment of our indigents into the Nigerian army, which is very important. Again, we need our civilian JTF and hunters to be recruited. This might be one of the ways to achieve a level of advantage, but it may do well to consider how many have been brainwashed by an ideology of destruction with an objective of turning them around. Oralu Ashunibare, Channels Television News. In part two, after the break, we have more on the insecurity in the northeastern part of Nigeria, and we have a security analyst, Bulama Bukhati, to discuss this as well. And the Kaduna State Governor blames the National Assembly for delaying action on state police and other recommendations for the restructuring of Nigeria. Please join us again.
Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on Channels Television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. More outrage over the killing of farmers in Bonu State. President Buhari sends federal government delegation to the state vowing to bring an end to insurgency in the Northeast. House Committee grills Minister of Interior on the inability of agro-rangers to stop the killing of farmers in Bornu community. EFCC rearranged former secretary to the government of the Federation, Babashir Lowal, and six others over alleged 544 million naira fraud. And American drug maker Moderna set to apply to the country's Food and Drug Administration for the emergency authorization of its coronavirus vaccine. We're now being joined on the news at 10 by a lawyer and security expert and sub-Saharan Africa analyst at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, Mr. Bulama Bukhati. He joins us from London. You're welcome to the news at 10. Thank you very much for having me. Our pleasure. We begin with getting your view on the demands and recommendations of the governor of Bornu State, Baba Gana Zulum, to the federal government delegation over this issue which includes the provision of mine resistance armored personnel carriers and the recruitment of mercenaries. Yeah, I think uh, most of the governor's recommendation are very well in place. They are very sensible recommendations. They are around uh, strengthening further our military and our international relations around uh, the multinational joint tax force so that our military will be better placed to defeat Boko Haram. But I'm not sure of his recommendation around mercenaries because uh, it brings uh, up constitutional issues. Our constitution, only our constitution only recognizes our military to secure our borders and our, in our security and then our police to police the country. And uh, mercenaries are usually non-nationals, non-members of any regular army being hired for materi uh, with material uh, inducement to come and fight. So there are constitutional issues there. Also, miss, missionary, missionaries are known to commit human rights abuses in other countries, including torture and uh, recruitment of child soldiers, gender-based violence and sexual-based violence, and many others. So I wouldn't support the, uh, the, the recruitment of missionaries or hiring of missionaries, but I totally support all other recommendations. Apart from flushing out the insurgents, getting the people back to their communities and their livelihood must be a very key part of the assignment. In view of what happened last weekend, what would you ask to be done to ensure that the peaceful return of the people after the years of insurgency uh, occurs? I think there should be short-term, medium-term -term and long-term goals in the fight against the insurgency. And I think the immediate need is to contain the violence, strengthen our security forces to contain the violence, and most of the governor's recommendations are around that. But after you do that, or while you do that, you also need to address the root causes of the violence. We know that Boko Haram peddles and thrives on a perverse interpretation of Islam, an ideology that frames its, its violence as a war justified by God, which is rewarded by God, and that mindset need to be, needs to be addressed. They also exploit poverty, inequality, uh, illiteracy, population expulsion, and other socio-economic crises or issues in that part of the country. All these issues would have to be addressed in the medium and the long term. But also the building of the lives and livelihood of Boko Haram survivors. About 2.5 million people are currently displaced. They need to be reintegrated. Some of them are displaced outside Nigeria, and therefore they are refugees outside Nigeria. About a year ago, I visited some of them in Chad, and I met about 13,000 Nigerians in a, in a refugee camp in Chad. They want to come back to home. They want to come back home. But unfortunately, their areas are yet to be secured, and I think government's attention should be around containing the violence, securing community, and ensuring that communities are back to their 
uh, places and their livelihoods are built. We pray and we hope that that happens. But finally, is there anything different that could be done to secure the northern region beyond what is being done now? I think the danger of what we are seeing now uh, is that rural communities are being displaced. About 90% of Boko Haram's recent attacks are against villagers, most of whom are farmers. And this is a threat to food security in Nigeria. Now, that's something we need to address. The, perhaps the Nigerian military might need to consider reconsider their super camp strategy by which they withdrew mili the military from rural communities and uh, areas and consolidated them in super camps. This uh, uh, strategy has succeeded in reducing military fatalities, but it has exposed communities to Boko Haram's attacks. And I think that strategy needs to be revisited. We know that our military is trying, but it needs to do better. The federal government needs to support the military better, like the presidency itself acknowledged later to, uh, earlier today uh, with weapons and equipment, especially intelligence and communication equipment, so that they, could, if they can defeat this group and start rebuilding lives. We certainly hope that that happens and an end comes to uh, these very, very terrible occurrences. Thank you so much for coming on the News at 10, Mr. Bulama Bokati, Sub-Saharan African Analyst at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change in London. Thank you for having me. Now, in the northwest of the country, the Kaduna State Governor, Malam Nasser Rafai, is unhappy at the recommendations of the APC Committee on True Federalism, which is supposed to give a legal, legal backing to address the spate of killings across the country, is yet to be adopted by the National Assembly. Governor Nasser El Rafai explains that the APC Committee report captures inputs across party lines and was adopted by the Nigerian Governors Forum, but regrets that the National Assembly is yet to put the bill into the process of legislation. The Kaduna State Governor was our guest this evening on our Politics Today program. There was broad consensus across everyone that things are not working. We need to do this for this for our country to, to, to work better. And uh, it's not about President Muhammad Buhari, it's the National Assembly that ought to take this and move, move it forward. Of course, President Muhammad Buhari can sponsor executive bills uh, uh, for that to happen, but uh, he doesn't need to. Any member of the National Assembly, as I said, can pick any of the bills. We drafted uh, more than 30 or such bills and put them through the process of legislation. And if it's a constitutional amendment, as soon as two thirds of the House and Senate pass it, it will go down to the state houses of assembly. And I can assure you, the Nigerian Governors Forum fully supports all the recommendations we made in that report. In fact, at the time we made the recommendation, even PDP governors like the former governor of Bayelsa State came to Kaduna, commended uh, my chairmanship of that committee and uh, put his whole weight behind it. So, you know, this is something in which there is broad bipartisan consensus. So there is no reason why it shouldn't be done uh, quick and fast. Uh, first, yes, it was a party committee, but there was broad bipartisan consensus. Many PDP governors, even in 2018, supported the, the broad thrust of our recommendations. And as I said, uh, Governor Seriaki Dixon even came to Kaduna and uh, more or less adopted the report of our committee. And uh, at the time, he was the chair of PDP Governors Forum. So there is broad bipartisan consensus. So it's not about moving it from our party to the government or anything like that. As I said, what we did was not just write a report and make recommendations. We, dr we actually drafted the constitutional amendments required. And in Taraba State, at least one person has been killed with others injured in the feud that ensued between youth of two different settlements in Waterboard area of Dalingo, the state capital. The clash, which is said to have been triggered as a result of a fight between two young men over a lady at a party, also led to the destruction of houses, worship centers with vehicles burnt and shops looted. The renewed crisis is coming five years after the previous one that took place in 2015. When the news at 10 returns, Central Bank of Nigeria grants Nigerians unrestricted access to foreign exchange in latest amendments to diaspora remittances. That's on Business News. Please join us again.
Welcome back. The Nigeria Police Force have re-arrested four persons who escaped from the Oko prison in Edo State during the aftermath of the NSAR's protests. The suspects who were arrested for alleged armed robbery and car snatching in Kaduna State confirmed that they were all part of the over 1,000 prisoners who escaped from different correctional facilities in Edo State. Parading them in Abuja, the forced public relations officer, Mr. Frank Mba, explains that the four escapees had formed a dangerous gang that started off where they stopped in crime before their convictions. During at the peak of the NSAS protest, which went ugly and violent in the past of the country, some of the nation's correctional facilities were attacked. And some of the correctional facilities, particularly in Edo State, recorded a mass escape. Today, we have four persons here. All of them escaped from the Oko prisons in Edo State. And as soon as they left prison, they forged a new alliance developed a new criminal network and went straight into, in, into another round of criminality. A former secretary to the government of the Federation, Mr. Babashir Lawal, and six others have been rearranged by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission over an alleged fraudulent 544 million naira grass cutting contract. The defendants again pleaded not guilty when the amended 10 counts of fraud were read to them before Justice Charles Agbaza of the High Court of the Federal Capital Territory, Dabi Abuja. The rearrangement, which is the second time since the case started, followed the death of the former trial judge, Justice Jude Ukeke, on August 4, 2020. Following the not guilty charges, or rather plea to the charges, the defense lawyers pleaded with the judge to allow their clients continue to enjoy the bail already granted them by the former judge. The EFCC had alleged, amongst others in the 10 counts, that the defendants fraudulently converted cumulative proceeds of grass-cutting contract worth over 500 million naira, which Mr. Lawal, as the then SGF, allegedly awarded to the companies in which he had interest. Trial has been fixed for January 20th to 22nd, 2021. Meanwhile, the Federal High Court sitting in Lagos will tomorrow hear an application by businessman Jimmo Ibrahim seeking to set aside an interim order which authorized the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria, Amcon, to take over his properties over an alleged 69.4 billion naira debt. On November 4th, Justice Aikawa made the seizure order, and on November 18th, Amcon announced that it effectively took over 12 properties belonging to the businessman and his firms. Displeased with the asset seizure, Mr. Ibrahim and his firms, through Akintola, the lawyer, approached the court with a motion and notice seeking to discharge the interim seizure order. They contended that the court made the seizure order in error because Amcon allegedly concealed material facts in its ex-party application leading to the seizure order. They urged the court to set aside the order for non-disclosure and misrepresentation of material facts. Justice Aikoa adjourned for the hearing in the matter till Tuesday. To politics, the chairman of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, Uche Sekundus, has called on the presidency and the Nigerian army to steer clear of the December 5th senatorial by-elections that will take place in Bayelsa State. The PDP chairman was speaking to PDP party faithful at the Peace Park in Yanagoa for a rally to garner support for the party's candidate. We offer one advice to the Commander-in-Chief. Please, sir, and our high-level ranking security chiefs, please, you can see the country falling. Please don't make it worse. Because if you deny the people the vote, you can make it worse. I, Nick, we want to plead with you. Please, 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 even those there in INEC, 
whether you are APC, you are uh, whatever you are called, officers of um, uh, the INEC, you have seen what happened in America. Allow the people's vote to count. If you don't allow the people's vote to count, you are just postponing the evil day. And now it's time for business news. Here's Anne Wanwudu. Thank you, Alumide. Hello and welcome to Business News. The Central Bank of Nigeria has announced that beneficiaries of diaspora remittances can now receive such inflow through the designated bank of their choice. Statements from the CBN says that such recipients may have the option of receiving foreign currencies such as dollars in cash or into their ordinary domiciliary account. The financial market regulator explains that changes in the receipt of foreign remittances has become necessary to deepen the foreign exchange market, provide more liquidity and create more transparency in the administration of diaspora remittances into Nigeria. And talking about the Naira, and the local currency has fallen to more than three-year low, down at 500 against the dollar at the parallel window of the Forex market after the central bank increased the exchange rate sold to Bureau de Change operators from 384 to 390 against the dollar last week. The local currency had strengthened by about 7.8% in September. And that's after the CBN introduced some measures which were targeted at exporters' and importers' demands for forex. However, the Naira was flat against the dollar at 390.25 at importers' and exporters' window at the forex market today. The governor of Delta State, Ifanyo Kowa, has assented to the state's 2021 revised 383 billion Naira appropriation bill with assurances of recovery from the economic challenges caused by COVID-19. Governor Kowa said the signing, while signing the budget within a month to the end of 2020, will avail the state government the opportunity to plan further towards the implementation of the budget from January next year. He explains that while a lot is still being contributed to improve the country's agriculture sector, some key projects are still on course. A lot is being done to grow the agricultural sector nationwide, including our state delta. But it will take time for these efforts to begin to manifest meaningfully. So as long as we are still dependent mainly on the oil economy, with the global pandemic and the shutdown going on in various nations of the world, we definitely will have a lot of shortfall, both in the prices and in the volumes of oil that is being sold in the international market. This obviously impacted very negatively on our budget in 2020 that we had to review our budget downward twice in the course of the year. With 17 gainers and 29 losers, Nigeria's stock market has ended the last trading day in the month of November positive, with about 82 billion naira added to the total value of listed equities today. Let's hear the details from BC Adibayo. Thank you for joining us on the Stock Market Reports. You can say it's not a bad way to start the week, and that's because in line with traders' expectation, the stock market ended the last trading day of November in the green amid a mixture of profit-taking and some bargain hunting. Well, this means that Bull maintains a dominance at the equities market for a better part of the month with quite an impressive performance, especially on a day like this where we saw intense sell pressure on the banking sector, which fell by 2.49%, as well as the industrial and consumer goods counter. Now, the 0.45% increase on the all share index was largely driven by the 53 Naira five cobalt increase on Airtel Africa's share price, while MTN Africa also added much support to the gain recorded in today's session. Now let's take a look at the activity chart now. Investors' appetite for equities remained strong for a Monday as 415.53 uh, million shares changed hands for nearly 
5 billion naira in over 5,200 transactions. Meanwhile, here are the top three gainers and losers for the day. Now, let's see if this positive momentum will be sustained into the start of December. And that's it on the Stock Market Reports. I am BC at Dubai. And that's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. The rest of the news at 10 continues with Ulumide. Thank you, Anne. Still ahead on the news at 10, American drug maker Moderna set to apply to the country's Food and Drug Administration for the emergency authorization of its coronavirus vaccine. And more from our London studios and around the world in five. Please stay with us. Welcome back. U.S. President-elect Joe Biden has appointed Nigerian-born attorney Adewale Adeyemo as Deputy Treasury Secretary. Adeyemo will serve under former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen, who Biden plans to appoint to lead the U.S. Treasury Department. Born in Nigeria, Adeyemo was raised in California, where he obtained a bachelor's degree before proceeding to Yale Law School for his legal education. He was first appointed to the Obama administration, but before then, he worked as an editor at the Hamilton Project, then served as senior advisor and deputy chief of staff to Jack Lew in the United States Department of Treasury. Drug manufacturing company Moderna is filing for U.S. and European regulatory approval of its coronavirus vaccine so that it can be recommended for widespread use. Regulators will look at trial data for the mRNA vaccine and decide if it's safe and effective enough to recommend for rollout. Let's join our London studio now, where Simon Pusey has more international news on Around the World in 5. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in 5. The American drug maker Moderna says it will apply to the Food and Drug Administration for the emergency authorization of its coronavirus vaccine. CEO Stephane Bansell said in an interview that, that the first injection may be given as early as December the 21st. The data shows that the vaccine is 94.1% effective and that the study that included 30,000 people has met the scientific criteria for approval. The company has said that it was on track to produce 20 million doses by the end of December and reach 500 million next year. Moderna is the second vaccine maker after Pfizer to apply for emergency use authorization. Meanwhile, the United States' top disease expert has warned the country could see a surge upon surge of coronavirus cases as people return home from the Thanksgiving holiday. Decisions Dr. Anthony Fauci said it was not too late for those yet to travel to help curb the virus by wearing masks and socially distancing. Last year, an estimated 26 million people passed through U.S. airports in the weeks surrounding the holiday. Health experts had called for people to spend Thanksgiving at home, but this week U.S. airports marked their busiest period since mid-March. More than 266,000 people have died in America from the virus so far. China's government has refused to apologize after posting a fake picture on an official Twitter account that depicted an Australian soldier murdering an Afghan child. The image referred to alleged war crimes by Australian soldiers, with allegations of the murders of Afghan civilians and prisoners. It comes during a time of escalating political tensions between the two countries. Australia's Prime Minister said Beijing should apologise for sharing the repugnant image. It is utterly outrageous, and it cannot be justified on any basis whatsoever. The Chinese government should be totally ashamed of this post. The Tigray People's Liberation Front leader, Debrezion Gebremichael, says his troops are still fighting against the military near the city of Mekele, which was seized by the government over the weekend. Ethiopia's Prime Minister, Abe Ahmed, has told Parliament that not a single civilian casualty has been reported in the nearly month-long offensive. The fight has taken a toll on the main hospital of the capital of Ethiopia's northern Tigray region. The Red Cross has warned that supplies of medicines, antibiotics and even gloves are dangerously low as it treats the wounded from the conflict around the city. The four French policemen caught on camera beating a black music producer at his studio in Paris earlier this month have been charged. Earlier last week, video emerged of white officers attacking producer Mikhail Zekler. The four suspects are now facing charges of intentional violence by a person holding authority. 
video has sparked protests around the country against police violence and a new bill that would restrict the right to film or take photos of police. The new Article 24 would make it a criminal offence to publish images of an on-duty police officer leading up to a year in prison and a fine of €45,000. Iran is currently burying its most senior nuclear scientist following his assassination last Friday on a highway near the capital. State TV showed the coffin of Mohsin Fakhri Zadeh draped in the Iranian flag being transported through a Muslim shrine. The defense ministry said his remains will then be taken to Imam Khomeini's shrine in the capital. Fakhri Zadeh was credited as the founder of Iran's nuclear program in the early 2000s. The country's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, is blaming Israel and the United States for his death. New Zealand's health and safety authorities have filed charges against 13 parties over last year's deadly White Island disaster. 22 people died when the country's most active volcano suddenly erupted last December with tourists on it. Ten parties now face charges under the Health and Safety at Work Act, which carries a maximum fine of 1.5 million New Zealand dollars. And finally, known as the world's loneliest elephant after languishing alone for years in a Pakistani zoo, Kavan has finally arrived in Cambodia where he can live with other elephants. The plight of Kavan, an overweight 35-year-old bull elephant, has drawn international condemnation and highlighted the willful state of Islamabad Zoo. The US pop star Cher met Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan on Friday before the relocation after she had campaigned for years and helped pay for Kavan to be moved. There was cheers and applause as his crate was lifted onto a lorry before he was taken by military convoy to the airport. He has since touched down in Cambodia, where he will live in a one million acre wildlife sanctuary housing a wide range of endangered species. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon the Nidra. Basketball Federation admits that the race for a place on the 2021 FIBA Afrobasket is not yet over, despite recording an unbeaten record in the first phase of qualifiers in Rwanda. With conflicting media reports over the team's qualification, the Federation says despite the D-Tigers' perfect start, it's too early to boast of punching the ticket with three more matches to play during the third window. Francis Stephanie Frappa will become the first woman to referee a men's Champions League match on Wednesday when Juventus hosts Dinamo Kiev in Turin. The 36-year-old has already made history as the first woman to referee in the French top flight. Bayern Munich goalkeeper Manuel Neuer plus top scorer Robert Lewandowski and midfielder Leon Goretzka will be rested for Tuesday night's Champions League clash at Atletico Madrid. Bayern coach Hansi Flick says that the trio were not at 100% and would be rested with the European champions having secured a place in the knockout stage last week with a 3-1 home win over RB Salzburg. And the Formula One doctor who helped to rescue Formula One driver Romain Grosjean says the Frenchman is recovering well, but there was a moment he feared the worst when he saw a Hollywood-style fireball at the Bahrain Grand Prix on Sunday. Grosjean, who is set to be discharged from hospital on Tuesday, limped away from his house with little more than burns to his hands and not a broken bone, a broken bone in his body. And that sports news is back to you a lot. Thank you, Ayo. And the main news again, there was more outrage today over the killing of 43 farmers in Bornu State at the weekend, just as President Mohamed Buhari promised to bring an end to insurgency in the Northeast. The President's message was conveyed by a federal government delegation that visited Bornu to commiserate with the people and the state government. That's it on the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Alumde McCauley. Do have a good night.